twice the speed of sound and shows off its reheat with a burst. A civil contrast, the small field twin pioneer. The distinctive C. Vixen naval fighter which leads in a stable mate, the Comet 4, now gloriously in service again and first in the Atlantic race. A Victor bomber, showing the new low-level labs or log bombing technique, throw the bomb off and then loop and half row to clear the sea half roll and away, and the wonder being not that it is well done, but that it can be done at all with such a huge jet. After the victor, a typical Farnborough contrast, the Auster small canvas aerobatics, always so beautifully done. Utility again in crop spray. Sheer spectacle, the Navy's aerobatic team of seahorse. Coloured smoke, beautiful figures traced in the sky. Lovely flying followed by a formation landing. aeroplanes of the 1958 Farnborough, the Compters. The Bristol 192, shown here landing, and as it lands, one engine is blanked off. And with one engine blanked off and flying on one, it gives a demonstration of single engine reliability. Skeeters and the new P-531 add their emphasis to the helicopter importance of 1958. The Westwood Circus, the Wessex, doing small space aerobats that the Worcester might end. The Widget, jaunty and gay, obviously enjoying itself. Navy's familiar chopper, a family of steady development. It is this development which has led to the prototype twin-engined Westminster, at the moment looking like a cutaway drawing of itself, but which can be a 40-seater airliner, a flying crane, indeed its uses and potentialities are almost endless.
rejoins its smaller companions, literally to take a bow. And that parade is followed by the dashing little ultra light, playing kittenish games with its attendant Lauren. Rotor tip car makes a rate of climb for this aircraft which is quite staggering. the impudence, the majesty, the majesty of perhaps the key aircraft of the show, the Rotodyne. This new idea in direct takeoff flight is a helicopter near the ground and a fast autogyro with ordinary air screws when in cruising configuration. The power goes on to the rotor tips and the big airliner becomes again a hover plane, a fascinating development for short length air journeys of the future. biggest delta. A futuristic giant at Farnborough, this aircraft too gets into the aerobatic act. The lab's bombing technique is demonstrated over again. The huge delta loops and then half rolls, elephantine, but efficient. A glimpse of secrets, the new standoff bomb carried under a Vulcan. Then, like puppies at play, the dashing and the cavorting of four hunters each with a variety of underwing stores. suddenly it was, 22 of them from 111 squadron doing that fabulous formation loop. lovely curves. A new art form, no longer just a stunt. Once again, Farnborough underlines the importance of aviation of all kinds and of Britain's place in this great industry.
This is Farnborough, 1959, the 20th flying display and exhibition organised by the Society of British Aircraft Constructors. Farnborough in southern England, the largest and most famous air show in the world. It reflects the growth of a whole industry, and its success is the success of British aircraft. One of the fascinations of this industry is its variety. One newcomer isn't really a plane at all, but as a revolution in transport, the hovercraft is attracting great interest at home and abroad. It may one day be as much in demand as the Viscount, which has earned a premier position on the air routes of the world. There's always a tremendous overseas interest in Farnborough, but never before has the show attracted so many visitors from abroad. Their numbers reflect the importance of the industry in world markets. Indeed, the first eight months of the year had set an export record. And there was every sign that 1959 would be an all-time high. Since the war, overseas buyers have spent nearly 900 million pounds on British aviation products. And exports are now running at the rate of three and a half million pounds a week. Here's the well-known Hawker Hunter. Besides earning 200 million pounds worth of overseas orders, it highlights another significant function of the industry, that is to provide weapons to fulfill Britain's defence programme. The missile display is a forceful reminder of the industry's rapid response to this programme. The English Electric Thunderbird, an anti-aircraft weapon in service with the Army. Another anti-aircraft missile, the Bristol Bloodhound, is playing a key role in the United Kingdom's air defence. Bloodhound is claimed to have the longest range of any missile of its type in the world. The Black Knight research rocket was designed by the Royal Aircraft Establishment in collaboration with the builders Saunders Row. It's a rocket for high altitude research. Now the flying display itself. The show lasts for seven days, and the daily climax begins with the aircraft being towed out and made ready for flight. To watch a flying display at Farnborough is an experience few can forget. The variety of machines, the impeccable timing of their performance, the stopwatch regularity of takeoff and landing. There's always a tremendous thrill of anticipation about it. Over 350,000 visitors saw this year's display, and they had perfect weather for it too. First in the program is the Comet, and de Havilland's chief test pilot, John Cunningham, goes aboard to show off the 4B version to the waiting crowds. Powered by four Rolls-Royce Avon jets, its takeoff run is exceptionally short. Let's go upstairs and get alongside the comet in the air. This is one advantage of seeing Farnborough on film. Wearing the colourful new livery of British European Airways, it will start operating early in 1960. The standard Comet 4 is already in service with BOAC and other airlines. The use of reverse thrust enables it to operate from quite small airfields. We spotted the Crown Prince of Nepal among spectators watching another jet, the pocket-sized Folland Nat a two-seat training version of this lightweight fighter. Incidentally, this prototype had only flown for 10 hours before its Farnborough appearance. It's a development of the single-seat fighter beyond. Another jet trainer is the two-seater version of the English electric Lightning. This machine first flew in the spring of 1959 
and it has the same performance as the fighter version. In other words, it's fully supersonic. The single-seat fighter furthest from the camera has been ordered in quantity for the Royal Air Force. Blackburn Aircraft's contribution in the transonic field is the NA-39, a two-seater strike aircraft for the Navy designed to give the high speed and accurate control needed for low-level attack. In its class, it's been described as ahead of any other aircraft in the world. Always a Farnborough highlight, formation aerobatics by the services. A twinkle roll, a new manoeuvre by scimitar jets, introduces the pilots of the Royal Navy, the men of 807 Squadron. Let's follow the fighter bombers in a formation roll, flying as if linked by invisible threads, while earth and sky revolve around. Have another look at the hovercraft. Floating on a cushion of air supplied from an Alvis Leonides piston engine, it glides over land or water without touching the surface. Its potential as a cross-channel or river ferry has brought many inquiries from overseas, and its designers are hoping to follow this prototype with a version weighing 40 tons. In striking contrast, here is the tremendous power potential of the V-bomber. Watch this fantastic takeoff of the Avro Vulcan. This version, the B-2, is a development of the world's first four-jet Delta Wing bomber. After a slow fly past, its four Bristol Sidley Olympus jets hurl the huge machine into the sky. From jets to turboprops, the Handley Page Herald with well-tried dart engines making a spectacular picture. It's a medium-range passenger or freight transport. As for the brand new airliners at Farnborough, the largest is the Vickers Vanguard. This machine has made a tremendous impact both at home and abroad. The reasons aren't hard to find. Vickers claim that its economy with Rolls-Royce Tyne engines could cut many passenger fares by 50%. Its design is the result of their experience with over 400 Viscounts. The whole thing was neatly summed up by the president of Trans-Canada Airlines, who have ordered 20. As good as the Viscount, but twice as big. Another of 1959's newcomers is the Argosy Freighter Coach, a new design from Armstrong Whitworth for the rapidly expanding air freight market. With its Dart turboprops, it can operate from almost any existing airfield, and that's a must for any multi-purpose machine. The Argosy can carry nearly 14 tons of freight or 83 passengers. It can be used as an air ferry for cars and passengers and there's a military version which has been adopted by the RAF. In whatever capacity, its great feature is economy. Another machine with a variety of uses is the Ferry Rotodyne, famous as the world's first vertical takeoff airline. Here's a Rotodyne's angle on the Farnborough scene. 
Down below, a visitor from Bahrain looks on as the Rotodyne goes through its paces. It combines the merits of helicopter and fixed-wing airliner. Vertical takeoff and landing, and forward flight at nearly 200 miles an hour. The production version will carry 65 passengers. Now, what's all this? A cabin full of nurses gives a vivid example of the capacity of this remarkable machine. The Bristol 192 is a twin-engine helicopter in production for the Royal Air Force. In an emergency, both rotors can be driven by one engine. Here it puts on a weightlifting act with the Bristol Bloodhound on the leash. Led by the Westminster Flying Crane, here's Westland's helicopter cavalcade. Research into vertical flight has produced some great advances. The short SC-1 is a delta wing research machine powered by five Rolls-Royce jets. It uses the thrust of four of them to give vertical lift, the other one drives it along. The lifting jets can also be inclined to give a forward thrust or directed forwards to act as a brake. It's the first machine of its type in the world. Now back to the runway where hawker hunters are lining up for one of Farnborough's aerobatic displays. These are the men and machines of Treble One Squadron Royal Air Force known collectively and expressively as the Black Arrows. traditions of the death or glory boys, the trailblazers of World War II, have been handed on to the pilots of the jet age. Their skill and daring are now combined in a display to thrill the Farnborough crowds. dive in a spectacular bomb burst over the field and we reach the finale of this Farnborough fly past. chapter of aviation progress written in the sky.